Hello, I'm Brad. And I'm Jason. You are listening to Dice, Dice in, in My Mind. You and I have been talking for a while about, and I should apologize in advance, hopefully my internet is good and we're going to have no issues here. If it is, then you'll hear Jason jump in and vamp, but um, we've been talking about, you've been pushing me to watch Andor for a yes, while now. Yes, And I have, I haven't so much resisted. I just, oh, it, no. I, I haven't just wanted to engage. I want to spend the time. I just haven't had the time. You, and I you, probably won't until I figure I'm trying to save a bunch of shows until the doldrums yeah. of January. Right. I was going to say, um, you've been busy and you've been catching up anyways. Yeah. So there's a couple shows that I'm going to use in January as a means of avoiding the, what is it? You're the seasonal. Def, uh, oh, the seasonal affective depression. Yeah. 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 I'm trying to, uh, to avoid that. I'm going to have Andor and a couple other shows to yeah. keep me busy. Yeah. But, nothing, nothing cheers a person up like watching 12 episodes of a morally ambiguous story. <laughs> which is why I brought it up. <laughs> I <know>. Because, because. <laughs> We've talked a bit offline about moral ambiguity. Um, we've talked about it in the context of gaming, specifically the games that um, you and I have both led, um, as well as in the context of these shows. And it really came to the forefront with you because I haven't watched it. Yeah. This idea of moral ambiguity, watching Andor. Yeah, yeah. I I wasn't expecting it to, or uh, let me rephrase that. I wasn't expecting my thoughts especially my thoughts around the podcast to go in that direction um although as as we will hear in our in our interview in just a, a few minutes it it did and it was it was honestly it was one of the best discussions as a discussion we've had on the podcast so uh thank you in advance james for for going there that was a legitimately good discussion no matter the, the the venue that said yeah like you said brett uh, andor uh first of all if you haven't seen it if our listeners haven't seen it it's really well done it is so un star trek like uh you could you know it because it's it's i'm stuck on uh, star wars i i've had a lot of star trek on the brain i don't ask uh, i always do well, that's but... that's well, well why don't we why don't we talk about that during gm corner because i know why it's been on the brain so oh um, I, oh because yeah we okay. had we had a we had a book arrival we'll talk yes about yes later. yes we did but um uh i watching watching andor so andor you know it's it's the story of cassian andor right who was in rogue one um and and i I've, I've maintained since i saw rogue one in the theater for the first time that it is the single best star wars pause movie i don't mean that it's my favorite and i don't mean that it's the well, best star wars one. out there there's really only two well Rogue hold one on solo okay, okay. So R- it's well, you had an a b yeah. choice there well but 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 truly that as a movie on its own merits okay, okay. i think rogue one as as a film as a story i think rogue one is the strongest of the entire franchise. I'm not saying it's a favorite. I'm not saying it's the best Star Wars, but I think is a film. Okay. okay. And what makes it so interesting is first, it doesn't have a happy ending. I, I love that, right? It doesn't have a traditional American ending. And two, it's it's not black and white. Solo wasn't really either, but it was. It was. It, I love yeah. Solo. It's one of yeah, my favorites. Yeah, but it was more. It was more comically yes. gray, whereas yes, com- and right. which is Rogue One was much more serious about that ambiguity and without a resolution to that ambiguity. And now yeah. watching Andor these twelve episodes uh, about a week after the series completed, and I you know I've been I glanced at a few reviews and they got me thinking, and I realized you know Andor really is this wonderfully morally ambiguous character, right? This is a good guy, if you will. Who's also yeah. sort right, sort of a bad guy. Done bad thing. Who's really, done bad things. And so Andor expl- Andor shows, doesn't explain. Andor shows us how that came to be. And it takes mm-hmm. its time doing it. And and to paraphrase our guest, who'll join us in a moment, um, <clears throat> we see that the character Andor um very much was morally uncertain because or at least within a very specific time, 
a very specific mm-hmm. set of places. And that just, I mean, that's wonderful storytelling, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, as as then we were thinking, well, who who could we talk about with this? Because initially it was the idea, well, why don't you and I just riff on this, right? Why don't we just talk about it? And obviously it didn't help that you hadn't seen it yet. And so then it's like, well, maybe Andor is not the point. Maybe just where where do we have, where do we see, where do we want morally ambiguous characters in our fiction, in our sci-fi, in our fantasy, in our RPGs, etc. cetera. And, and James Sutter, came to mind he he's an expert at this right he he frequently mm-hmm. as an accomplished author not to mention right one of the creators of pathfinder and starfinder right you might have heard of those uh he he has written a lot of intentionally morally ambiguous characters uh mm-hmm. in his books and and he's when we had him on the show many months ago um he mentioned that in passing but but it wasn't what we were focused on and i didn't think anything of it and after seeing Andor, it was like, oh, we need to see if he'll spend some time with us. And he did. So we're we're very lucky. Um, I know, Brad, what, what do you want to say before we, we head over? Well, I think I think you summed it up, and I I don't think I should or could add anything better before we actually have the discussion with James. I think there will be some good commentary and discussion afterwards before we head to the GM corner. Yeah, so let's go over right now. James L. Sutter is a co-creator of the Pathfinder and Starfinder role-playing games. From 2004 to 2017, he worked as an editor and developer for Paizo Publishing, starting on Dungeon Magazine, moving on to do foundational work for Pathfinder, and eventually becoming the creative director in charge of launching Starfinder, as well as the executive editor of the Pathfinder Tales novel line for Paizo and Tor Macmillan. In 2017, he left Paizo to write full-time. Indeed, his latest novel, Dark Hearts, a YA contemporary romance, is now available for pre-order from St. Martin's. It will be published on June 6, 2023. All right, well, uh, we are thrilled to welcome back to Dyson Mind James Sutter, who joined us some time ago, but we asked if he would slum it with us one more time because he's a master of moral ambiguity in his fiction. And well, James, welcome. It's really good to see you again. <laughs> Thank you. Good to be here. I'm glad you clarified in my fiction. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's very important. important. <laughs> right. I try to be right. fairly moral the rest of the time. Yeah. No judgment here. Right. Right. It's it's we're not here to judge. But but seriously, I mean like when we talked to you last time, the first time, a lot of people know you from Pathfinder, they know you from Starfinder, but you are a, a, an accomplished, a prolific author in your own right. And I remember, we remember the last time we chatted with you, you had mentioned moral ambiguity and it just, it didn't click. And then as you know, when we had emailed you to invite you back, I had just finished watching um, Andor. And right. we're not going to talk about that because I'm the only one who's seen it right now, not in the world, but on this little chat. And I was so taken by how the story focuses on explaining the development and then kind of concretization of Andor's moral ambiguity, right, of very much a good and bad person, in his case, in service to a higher cause. Um and that's kind of your shtick. So I would, we'd just love to pick your brain about this. <laughs> right. Well, and you know, that's something that I remember really uh, watching the first of, I mean, it's hard to even describe it, the new Star Wars movies, you know, the, the, um, I guess, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. There it is. Um, looking at those, one of the problems I remember coming out of the theater with was saying like, they're not putting any juice any moral ambiguity into the bad guys Agreed. in this right you know you've got mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know some of these speeches where it's just the bad guys are just being bad for the sake of being bad and that's the laziest yeah. thing you can do yes. with a villain you know i remember saying you put untold millions of dollars into these movies couldn't you have hired like you know somebody out of the game of thrones writers room for just 10 minutes to like punch this up because right. if you think about it you know i, I remember thinking sitting there watching and thinking there are so many great compelling justifications for the empire you know you can say all sorts of things yeah. that 
will feel true until you dig into the ramifications of it. Right. And like, as we've seen, I mean, speaking as an American, you know, growing up in steeped in the American empire, my entire life, yeah. there's so many justifications people use for yeah. all sorts of, you know, keeping people down, messing with people in other countries. Yeah. Like it's not hard to justify if you tap into people's fear, tap into people's right. desires. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're not doing that in any story, you're really missing a lot. Even even Star Trek, granted post Roddenberry Star Trek, but even Star Trek, like with DS9, less so with Voyager, um, certainly with the the Kelvin timeline, right? There was a lot of moral ambiguity. You'd have very good people who were doing some really bad things, and vice versa, and that was like in this utopia. Right. Well, and, I, you know, I love a story where people are all trying to do good things. Right. You know, I am um, sure. Have either of you read Becky Chambers, like A Long Way to a Small Angry Planet uh, or any of those? The books? entire series and both of the short stories. She has become yeah. one of my favorite writers. Yeah, same. And one of the things that I loved about uh, A Long Way to a Small Angry Planet the first time I read it was that it felt like a future where everybody was legitimately trying to just get along and there are still conflicts yes. there are yes. still problems but folks were fundamentally good in a way that i feel like a lot of science fiction and fantasy has been really dark for quite a while now yes um yes. and so it was refreshing to get that star trek x esque blast mm -hmm. of positivity but at the same time, I think that yeah. most of the time, uh, you know, people aren't, like you say, wholly good or bad. Mm -hmm. People are complicated and you need to get into that and show people's reasons for why they're doing what they're doing. Well, like, um, I mean, kind of that whole solar punk vibe that she's got going on, right? The I'm I'm blocking now. Sorry, it's Monk and... Oh, uh, Monk you know, and Robot. Right? Thank you, Monk and Robot. Series, right, yeah. right. The, both of the, but I mean, those are literally plays on moral like plays and play acting are yeah. plays of moral ambiguity right uh, from the ground up through the lens of this robot who's trying to understand ethics right exactly it's all exploring that stuff and you can you know you can explore it in different ways i feel like uh if uh if i were to say anything bad about becky chambers which i wouldn't because i love those books but like part of the joy and the weakness of those books sometimes they can be a little uh a little too on the nose, a little too comfortable. Like they're very trying to show the sort of the bright side of everything or not, not the bright side, but like everybody in those books is so good that it's refreshing, but it's not necessarily as believable, but yeah. it's a nice uh, counterpoint to something that's grim dark. You know, it's the other end right. of the spectrum, Right. but you know, and I, I like the dark stuff too. Like the thing, when I think of moral ambiguity, I immediately think of Game of Thrones, especially when Game of Thrones was uh, firing on all cylinders, right? Like those those seasons where everybody agrees that it was a good show. Uh, it was because you had so many characters who were at once compelling and, you know, you, you loved them, but also they were maybe despicable. And you sort of just didn't know where anybody was going to go, but they all felt so believable. Um, and I think that was that was the power of that, right? You had... You know, you're rooting for Jamie and Tyrion and all these people who, you know, have done bad stuff in the past and are going to do it again. But also you see them doing good stuff. I have do you to think admit there's oh, do you think there's a, a societal component to it where it can be um, just based off of, you know, what we went through with the pandemic and and obviously a lot of upheaval politically and all that that it's difficult for people to grasp it i just i can think of folks that want to read you know want to read or watch and i'm playing devil's advocate here mm -hmm. yeah. that it might be it might feel too complex or too real life for folks and that's why oh. we aren't seeing it as prevalent oh yeah well this is i mean this is not a new problem even but i agree that probably the pandemic has uh, strengthens people's desire for stuff that just has has unambiguous good guys or heroes that you can vote for or root for. Um, but I think, uh, you know, so coming out of gaming, as I have, I love moral ambiguity in a game like Pathfinder or Dungeons and Dragons or whatever. But a lot of people really don't because those games, especially when they're really combat based, you know, classic tabletop role-playing games are all about killing things and taking their stuff, right? Like, you know, the there's the, all the tropes online about 
you know, adventuring parties being, quote, murder hobos, you know, people who just sort of wander around killing things. And I think that, you know, I think it's fun to play with, okay, so you killed that orc, you open the door, and in the next room is that orc's three children who now have no, you know, no parent. Good for you, you know? Uh, I find that reckoning really interesting, but I think a lot of people just find it depressing. They want release. They want you know, a Star Wars-esque good guys with a capital G. And for them having to think about all of the compromises and moral ambiguity is really depressing and exhausting. And I I think that's fine. I I get it, right? Like, that's the appeal of the zombie movie, right? Because you can kill everybody in it and not feel bad about any of it because they're all zombies. They are all, by definition, not somebody you have to feel bad about killing. Um, so I get it. I just think it's fundamentally a lot less interesting than having to make moral choices. Interesting. So in, in your writing, James, what, like, I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, not to give away any of your books, right? Like the plot right, right, right. uh, or the resolutions, but, but, but still, where do I use it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how do you do this as a writer? What do you, what are the tropes you find yourself attracted to around moral ambiguity? Well, well, most of them. I mean, I've got my um my second novel, The Redemption Engine, is literally all about the question of ethics in a fantasy realm. It's the idea of how does free will play into morality, right? So if you're in a fantasy world where you have the ability to magically turn an evil person good, should you? Is that good because you are making somebody good? good quote unquote and you know you're you're reforming them by force but if they have no choice in it is that a violation of somebody's you know personal sovereignty is that are they even good if they have no choice and what about creatures like you know in a lot of fantasy games angels are good and devils are bad right but if they're just born that way if they didn't have a choice in the matter are they really evil like if a devil has no choice but to be evil are they evil? Do they need some sort of agency? Um, like, and so that's kind of what that whole book is about. Like the redemption engine in the title is literally a machine that can take evil souls and purify them. And there's all sorts of questions around, is that good? Is that bad? Um, you know, what are you doing with that? And I find that sort of thing really fascinating. Uh, but really just in, in general at we're talking about moral ambiguity, it's just about knowing your characters and knowing why they're doing what they're doing. Everybody's yeah. the hero of their own story. Yeah, that's lovely. Okay, so maybe this takes us a little too far afield, but I'm I'm really nah, curious. Go for it. Yeah, thank you. Good. I love we love talking to you. It's so <laughs> so as I'm sure you are aware, uh, Wizards, i.e., D and D, as we record this very recently, and one might add the non sequitur finally indicated that in their you know update D D one or whatever it's going to be that there will be no more races okay right? and yeah. and the, yes there'll be species but that races species whatever will no longer be differentiated in terms of scores right this elves won't sure. have x y and z as a quote-unquote racial trait yeah I'm just curious what you think of that because you know with what you just said to me and i i have thoughts about this we both do in both directions mostly in favor of yes finally but still th- that that whole notion around race in any in any game or novel uh has the potential for moral ambiguity has the potential for being seen as morally questionable or ambiguous i'm just curious what you think oh well i mean so man i think I, I sort of thought you were going to go a different place in terms oh, well, of let's tying, go there too. <laughs> tying race uh, or species to morality, right? Like oh, even know, better. in older versions of the games, there were alignments that went with well, exactly. uh, yes. species yes. and that, you know, that too. But I think, I think it's a smart move. Um, I understand why some people really like the idea of like, oh, elves are fast and dwarves are strong. And, you know, like this is, you get some sort of mechanical differentiation between the species that Mm -hmm. makes for fun gameplay. I get that. But at the same time, I think it's very smart of them to say, look, this game is for everybody. This game is for everybody to play however they want to play. And so 
the more freedom you have to create your character the way you envision them, the better. Because also there's a huge amount of variety. I mean, in just humanity, right? Yeah. Like we have anything you can imagine that a human could do. Um, there's somebody out there who does it and other people who could never dream of doing it. Right. So why would it be any different in a game? Like probably somewhere there is a dwarf who is as flexible and dexterous as an elf, you know? Um, but, but I, so in terms of hard coding things, I actually, when I think about the alignment system, like that's yeah. the, the oldest argument in the book, right? Like people right. have been arguing about that since it came out. Um, and I love the the classic alignment system. And for anybody who doesn't, I'm sure everybody listening to this podcast knows, but we're talking the, you know, lawful good versus, you know, at one, uh, you've got the square, right? And sort of lawful mm -hmm. and good on these, uh, on one end of the axis and yep. then, you know, chaotic evil on the other. And you've got the two axes. Um, I find that situation super fun mm -hmm. because it's broken. And it's been broken oh. since the beginning, right? Like, I, I think that the ways in which the alignment system don't work yeah. are what make the alignment system interesting. Okay, say more about that. If, yeah, if, I'm well, curious. Well, just the idea of, you know, is it about objective? Like, how do you judge somebody, say, like, good versus evil? Is it about their intention? Is it about what they do? You know, you start getting into all of this different uh, philosophy, right? Is it utilitarianism? Is it yeah. Kant? You know, what is all this yep, stuff? Yep, yep. Um, and so I love playing against type and raising those questions. Like for okay. instance, in Pathfinder, uh, mm -hmm. one of the most controversial things I created in that setting was there's a gold dragon which are, you know, in the book, gold dragons are lawful good. They uh -huh. are the good guys. Uh -huh. And this dragon uh, creates a utopia, um, a little takes over an island and says, look, humans, you, you keep messing it up. You've always got wars and, you know, prejudice and all these terrible things. So I'm going to create the perfect human society. I'm going to select just the best of you. And I'll invite you to come here. You know, it's not, it's not forced. Uh, I will invite you. And if you come here, you can have, a life of leisure you can pursue your pursuits you know do all whatever you want to do i'll fund yeah, it all yeah you just need to sign a contract saying that like i can control you know i i set all the laws you agree to obey me and you know you'll mate with who i tell you to mate with and like we'll raise the perfect humans um oh, and interesting. from the dragon's perspective who's yeah. breeding humans the way we breed you know dogs and cats right. um right he's thinking like this seems uh this seems great like i'll make the perfect human society um and from another perspective that's eugenics exactly so you know <laughs> like so i got in this you know years long uh debate on you know uh with the creative director james jacobs and very good natured you know we just had mm -hmm. each other on the message boards um cuz I'm saying like, well, the dragon thinks he's doing good, you know, so is he good? You know, who can, you know, we never explicitly said his alignment. Um, and, uh, and, you know, Jacob's perspective is like, this dragon's a Nazi. Like it's, it's right. eugenics. Right. Um, and like the point was never that I am in favor of eugenics. Cause obviously I'm not, that's crazy. Um, but what I am in favor of is people asking the question of is this dragon can this dragon still be lawful good if everything's it's all contractual right like if somebody gives away their rights via a contract entered into freely is that morally permissible and i'm not saying whether it is nice. or isn't nice. i'm mm. saying it's useful to ask those questions uh and i think that's really interesting now that said you can get into a ton of trouble um you know asking these questions in your work um yeah, unless you sure. have mm -hmm. yeah no but i mean like and i get it right um which is why it's important to make sure that you showcase not just one side of it but also right. the objections right. so i think if you're gonna have that sort of is this okay yep. you know uh moral ambiguity you need to then have another character there who says no, that's not okay. And here's the reasons why. And mm -hmm. being able to have that argument in print uh, or in your game 
is really fun, is really interesting. And that's where I think gaming can make us think a lot more. You know, the, right. The great value of science fiction and fantasy is that you can get people to think differently right. about the you real know. world, right. not realizing they're talking about the real world. Right. Like they yeah, think they're yeah. talking about elves and dwarves yeah. and really they're having a nuanced conversation on race relations and they don't realize it yes, exactly. until later. Right. I'm curious that, I mean, you, you hinted a little bit about the, of this, but, but before the alignment chat, I, I'm curious. So as a, as a writer, as a creator, whether it's in game, whether it's in a novel, I mean, regardless, as a presumably and obviously moral individual, as you assured <laughs> us, right. And, and right, right. No, okay, no judgment, but, but seriously, as a moral individual, how, how do you get in the mindset to write really nuanced morally ambiguous characters and oh. and no know where the you know like nowhere to fall like where's the balance where it's not quite too much you know i mean what's your process for that well i think so the way i try to think about it and i think this is even a little bit useful in understanding other humans sometimes is try and think about what is the root uh, emotion that's driving them? What is the fear that's driving them? What is the the, the sort of spark? And um, you know, I listened to an interview once with a woman who was a, a Democrat working high up at Fox News, and this was years ago. Um, but somebody asked her, "How do you work in that situation? How do you hang out with these people who believe things that you think are abhorrent?" Yeah. Um, and she said, "Well." You know, I might disagree with them on policy, but like, you know, I sort of try to always dig the next step down and say, OK, well, they think something really bad about immigration. Well, why? Because they're afraid of immigrants uh, taking their jobs. OK, yeah. well, what's underneath yeah. that? Well, underneath that is a fear of losing your job or a fear of not being able to provide for your family. And that fear, she said she was saying like that fear she could relate to. You know, at if you dig down far enough, yeah. there's only a few yeah. basic human, you know, fears, emotions that kind right. of drive everything. Right. Um, and so yeah. even if you don't relate to how someone is expressing that, if you look deep enough, you can relate to the thing that is sparking it. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and I think that if you do that, and now I'm not saying that that means you need to love everybody, even if they're nope. being nope. a jerk. But I do think it's really helpful to understand somebody. And then with your villains, you can mm -hmm. do the same thing. Either you start with what it is that drives them, what they're afraid of, and then work up from there into their evil scheme. Or you start with their evil scheme and you work backward to figure out what is the fear, what is the trauma, what is the, right, right. the unfilled need that's driving them. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think there's a thing that I do for all my characters now that I got from a book called Story Genius, which I really recommend to people. Um, Lisa Crone's the author. Okay. But at some point she says in there that every character is motivated by a misbelief about the world, something they think about the world that is wrong, that over the course of the book or the story you're telling, they should figure out uh you know, they, they should change. Right. And that's sort of the the best character arc is when right. somebody starts out misbelieving something about the world and then finds out the truth. And so mm -hmm. I before I write a character, I try to yeah. figure out, OK, what is it that they believe? Is mm -hmm. it that they believe that everybody will always leave them so they need to leave first? Right. Is it oh, yeah. they yeah. believe that uh, they're not worthy of love? Is it that they believe that everybody you know, hates them or is judging them? Like, what is their thing that they believe that drives them that is a problem? Um, and is I think that, yeah, sorry. sorry. No, no, I was just going to say, when you're, when you're starting to write and you're dealing with this topic, do you kind of, maybe a simplistic question, do you kind of storyboard this out in terms of the underlying, you know, underlying issues? Yeah. yeah, if I'm writing a novel, absolutely. Like, I'll sit down and do up a little character brief for everybody and I think people are used to doing, you know, characters like character sheets where they go, oh, here's the eye color. Here's, you know, how tall they are, how much they weigh, that kind of thing. But over the years, and I used to do that too, but over the years, I found that that's actually much less useful than knowing what is the thing that, what is the sort of flaw that's driving them? You know, what is the thing that they are scared of? What is the thing that, 
they they believe that's incorrect. And that helps yeah. me figure out what is their arc going to be over the course of the story. And that's and, what that's what drives the story. And this is this goes for protagonists as well as antagonists. Yeah, yeah, yeah it goes okay. for everybody. Um, now that said, if I'm doing, you know, a game book or something, if I'm writing an adventure, I often don't do that same level of, you know, if I don't necessarily need to write, you know, 5,000 words of backstory to figure out exactly <laughs> why the red dragon is pillaging the countryside. Right. But, you know, having just spending 10 minutes or a paragraph figuring out why somebody might do a thing. Uh, allows you to have much more interesting villains and everybody knows you know the the best part of any hero villain encounter is that speech where they go we're not so different you and i you know we like we both want x <laughs> you know and that's that's fun you know people maybe i'm wrong but i get the impression people like magneto a lot more right. than Professor X, even though <laughs> Professor X is the good guy, um, because they're they're the same character, but having the same goals yes. gone different ways. And that makes him so compelling. So why wouldn't you want to do that for all your villains, right? I could I re I remember even Jason and I played, I was attracted back in the days of when I was first reading Dragonlance. Um, those neutral characters because of what you're exactly saying. Oh, you kind of don't know, yeah. you know, you know, whether it was lawful, neutral, chaotic, neutral, whatever it was, you kind of kind of see them thread the needle in between yeah. those two. And yeah. it always right. made it more interesting. Well, and also just the fun of an, <laughs> of an objective alignment system, you know, that the idea of absolute morality in a game system, yeah. the fun of that is breaking it. The fun of that is the fact that like you can never have, you can be as lawful good as you want, but it's really hard to make a system of laws that doesn't screw somebody over. And yeah. so, you know, when I, I think it's really interesting when the lawful and the good come into conflict, right? Uh, yeah, yes. And yeah. I think that's useful. I think that can be really fun in designing pantheons. You know, if your game's going to have a bunch of different gods, yeah. one of my favorite things is, okay, so you've got a lawful god, a chaotic god, or, you know, a lawful good, chaotic good, neutral good. Yeah. They're all good. What do they think of each other? You know, because each of them is probably that's convinced that the other one's right. Or even better, if you have two lawful good gods... Well, the fact that you have two of them in two different churches probably means that there's something that, you know, church A thinks church B is doing wrong. What are those conflicts? Like, how do they resolve them? That's interesting. I, I just keep getting flashbacks to the news. I mean, so many, so much politics is just right. what you said these days, either both lawful good or both lawful evil. They're still, they, <laughs> right. I mean, whichever well, way I'm you getting want steadily less lawful all the time. Less lawful. <laughs> and there's, like, a, there's a little yeah. bit of chaotic neutral in there as well. There's a lot, yeah. There's I a lot of think, chaotic neutral in there. Yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> chaotic neutral. There's some, there's some evil. And, you know, I guess I also would throw out that while I think it's really interesting to have villains that are understandable, that are relatable, yeah. that you can get into, I'm also not uh i'm not a cultural relativist in this to the extent mm -hmm. that like i think you can have evil i think there are things that can be understandable and still wrong in either an absolute sense or yeah. at least absolute in the mind of the viewer like i have zero problem with uh with saying this person is evil or we're going to treat this person as evil even if i understand where they came from. You don't have to excuse the serial killer just because you know what trauma made yeah. him a right. serial killer. Right. You can understand him and still say, this is not okay for society. Like, you know, this person needs to be punished, that kind of thing. Not, not to bring this dark, but since we're kind of going there and before, <laughs> yeah. before we transition, yeah. just to, to draw a dip a little bit into real life. So it's been a long time, but when I was, when I was in school, um, I spent sev I spent six months in a rotation doing therapy with sex offenders. Okay. And and I bring this up only because it's exactly real life, albeit in extremis, what you said, right? You could see, okay, some of these guys, you could see 
how this developed right over their background it didn't change anything but you could better understand the dilemma so you know what's interesting is actually growing up uh my mother worked uh for a juvenile correction agency and later a mental hospital yeah. and was responsible for developing curriculum for juvenile sex offenders oh wow um and back in the 80s was sort of one of the first people i'll bet doing doing this sort of thing where saying like hey has anybody noticed that like Almost all of these juvenile sex offenders were themselves victims. Right. Maybe that's correlated. Maybe we mm -hmm. should do something other than mm -hmm. just shock therapy. Mm -hmm. And so she mm -hmm. was developing these treatment programs. Um, yeah. And uh, and I, you know, at the time as a kid, I didn't really process oh. what what it was, except that, you know, every... <laughs> Every year in elementary school, at some point, I would get sent home with a note that said, please ask James not to explain what his mother does for <laughs> <laughs> the career, career day show and tell was not a thing they wanted. Um, but uh, but yeah, I guess she was she's kind of a big deal with it. But, it, yeah, but so no. it was interesting to grow up with that idea of basically all of these people that did terrible things had been victims themselves of terrible things and how how do you break that cycle how do you understand mm -hmm. that cycle um and again it doesn't mean you know she wasn't hiring them to babysit me but right. like but you could still understand and have compassion even while yeah. taking what measures you needed to take keep society safe right and so bring it to bring it back to fiction and you know and, and writing <laughs> yeah. and, well no no but but it also makes for wonderfully interesting sometimes complex characters yeah yeah i mean all your <laughs> none of us are 100 percent good or 100 percent evil just as real people and so i think that it's it's useful to know i mean even just to ask yourself with every character it's like what would people love about this character and what would people hate about this character? You know, what, what about this person annoys their friends? What about this person makes them a great friend? You know, just like those sorts of questions, knowing uh, yeah. both ends of the spectrum within the person yeah. can give you a lot to play with. You have a, um, to transition a little bit mm -hmm. maybe early, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, you have a new book coming out. Next yeah. Year. And um, in in transition to that, how does doing this, how does talking about moral ambiguity play into your writing with young adults? Does it does it resonate? Have you found it to resonate, or do you have to play more, you know, one way or the other? Oh, no, I think you know people might be surprised, but I actually think that my experience reading and writing young adult fiction is that young adult fiction deals way more with all the complexities of human relationships and morality than a lot of adult fiction. You know, I feel like in, especially in adult science fiction and fantasy, where I've spent a lot of my life, like they don't, it's less common to get folks really focused in on the nuance of character, um, the nuance of people's relationships, because, you know, the world is blowing up or the dinosaur is attacking or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas, especially young adult romance, which is where I'm writing now and what I read a lot of, you know, you don't have the crutches necessarily. I'm not saying that science fiction fantasy or, you know, a thriller plot or whatever is always a crutch. But when you don't have that option, young adult contemporary romance is just real people in, you know, realistic people in realistic situations. And the stakes are, are they going to get together or not? which ultimately is a fairly unimportant question. So in order to make that compelling, the authors really have to nail the character voice, the character's sort of internal experience, and frankly, young adulthood, uh, and as a result, young adult media, is all about the sort of tumultuous moral questions, who am I, who should I be, you know, that uh, finding yourself that I think is really much more complex than you know, Jack Reacher punching some guy in the face, right? No, no, no offense. Like there's, yeah. there's a place, you know, I also write comic books. So like there's a place for sometimes you just shoot somebody and say a cool quip, but that's what really made me fall in love with, uh, you know, young adult contemporary romance. Um, Interesting. And so that's, that's now what I'm doing. Uh, 
you know, I'm still playing, I'm still playing with comics and with gaming stuff and whatnot. But early on in the pandemic, I was working on some really dark dystopian science fiction and just feeling bad. And I, uh, I turned around and I'd been reading a bunch of young adult romance to try and sort of lift my spirits because it's yeah. so much fun. I'm and sorry, you like, must remember your adolescence very differently than I remember mine. But you, but go on. Wait, well, yours wasn't full of tumultuous. <laughs> yours wasn't no, you, highly emotional. So you you said you were fear. reading you were reading YA to lift your spirits. It's like I don't remember it like that. Sorry, <laughs> go keep going. <laughs> no, no, you're right. You're right. Well, the, the thing with the romance is that usually some things will work out in the end. Um, so, <laughs> so there's it. something there. Okay. Um, but also it's just it's fun. I like the pop culture element. But anyway, mm -hmm. so I. I just wanted something different. And so I thought, I wonder if I could do this. You know, I've spent nice. you know, 15, 18 years writing science fiction and fantasy. Yeah, wow. I wonder if I could just do contemporary romance. And, you know, I sat down and it just started going. And it's probably wow. the fastest novel that I've written. Um, and, you know, it wasn't all smooth sailing. Like it took... Yeah took me a while of finding an agent to represent young adult because I had never been in that space before. Right. But um, yeah, people liked it. And by all accounts, it's kind of the best thing I've written. Uh, so I'm really, wow. I'm really excited. Uh, and I think it's just because it's got that fun bantery voice, that humor. I guess I should tell everybody uh, the book is called Dark Hearts and it's all about falling in love with the boy who stole your chance at rock stardom. So the idea is the main character formed a band with his friends eventually got bored with it, you know, and got pissed off at them and quit. And then they got super famous. So now his ex best friends are super famous in the band that he started, but he's just stuck in high school. Uh, and so then, you know, he and the lead singer come back into contact and it's a sort of friends to enemies to friends to lovers kind of thing. And of course also a sort of, you know, bisexual awakening because he doesn't realize he's queer until this book. Yeah. Um, and so it's just like, it's really fun and funny and upbeat. Uh, but at the same time, to tie it to moral ambiguity, there is an element of ambiguity to all of the characters in it because they all have flaws as well as good things. And like the main character is, you know, he has reasons that you love him, but he's also super resentful. Um, you know, he's somebody yeah. who feels like he's 17 and thinks that he's missed his shot, right? Like that his life is effectively yeah. over because yeah. he, you know, had the winning lottery ticket and threw it away. Mm -hmm. And so, and which is something that I actually can relate to a lot. Um, well, I didn't have the same exact thing. Uh, you know, I can remember being 18, 19 and playing in a band and feeling like because I hadn't been signed yet, you know, right out of high school and because I was seeing other kids, you know, coming up behind me young bands getting signed wow. feeling like oh well that's it i've missed my shot like i'm a has-been yeah and i'm not even you know and that's it 18 or 19 right, right. the idea that your your career is over um and so you know some people uh when i was showing the book around were like can a teenager really relate to like the feeling of being a has-been um and i was saying well I did. I I always thought that I'd missed my shot. Like every year it was like, if I haven't succeeded by now, I'm never going to succeed. And that was true at 18, 19, 20, you know? Oh, well, so dark hearts. Yeah. Coming out with, uh, coming out from St. Martin's. Yeah. Big, big publisher in June, June six available for pre-order now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's even going to be, um, I guess, I don't know if we've announced it yet, but, uh, in addition to being available in English around the world, it's also going to be translated into a bunch of different languages. So keep oh, that's your awesome. eyes out. That's yeah. Cool. Um, I think I can say, you know, so it's going to be in, uh, you know, um, Finnish and Russian and Portuguese and, uh, Oh, I'm missing one and Dutch. Um, and I so think all the possibly more. Ones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, there's going to be a lot when somebody was saying like, Hey, we, or when my agent, told me uh you know we sold finnish rights i was like that's whoa amazing. i don't i i know literally nothing about the finnish language that's gonna be right. so fascinating mm. but um oh, but yeah cool. so i'm really excited for folks to check it out and see this mm. new version of my writing we're really eager to see it um we want to be mindful of your time we know you're on the clock oh yeah um, that's good 
yeah, we, we really appreciate you coming back and spending time with us and being morally ambiguous with us, if not directly, then vicariously. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sure we'll see. Uh, <laughs> hopefully I clarified things enough so that people won't be like, I heard James is into dragon eugenics. Like, no! <laughs> <laughs> people, you, you, you heard it here first. That's going to be a whole new line. I think, I think if Jason, I think Jason's going to make that the snippet. James is yeah. into dragon eugenics and have <laughs> yes. just that 10 second snip. <laughs> the point is to make people ask the questions, not yeah. to answer the questions. That's well, but, the... but I mean, I, I think we both really love that because that's right. That's what the world needs more of right now, of asking the questions, of not being afraid yeah. to be challenged by questions, right? In the marketplace of ideas, every, every question is an equal, every answer is an equal, but we have to be able to talk about them and then right. figure out and don't where we want to go. And don't be offended by them. Right. Don't be offended by being asked a question. Well, right. and it's, it's hard, right? Because I think on the one hand, everybody's in their own echo chambers and yeah. that's bad. But on at the same time, you know, it's hard to find people that actually want to argue in good faith uh, yes. about, yes. you know, these various ideas. And also it is important to recognize that, you know, there is a, there is a cost sometimes for, you know, especially for certain people to engaging in these conversations. No. Uh, so I don't no. feel like, you know, everybody needs to, you know, one of those people that it's like, you owe everybody an argument. I don't think you owe everybody an argument, but I do think it right. is useful to, you know, spend some time trying to figure out why somebody might believe what they believe, e even if only because it's a lot easier to change somebody's mind if you understand where, they where they're they coming from and if you can show them that you're willing to listen, right? Yeah. You know, that's yeah. that's the whole thing about deep canvassing and the idea of how do you actually make a difference in, you know, in real terms of changing somebody's politics it's not by screaming at them on Facebook. Yeah. Like the, you know, the best yeah. data we've got says that it's stuff like deep canvassing where you find somebody and you really listen to them. Yeah. And then in the process of listening to them and showing them that you're hearing them, then you can also present your own side. And in building that bond with somebody, sometimes, you know, they'll start to see you as more of a person too, and start to want to Oh, yeah. start to yeah. want to agree with you like we're fundamentally mm -hmm. social mm -hmm. animals it's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why people are such <laughs> are frankly such jerks on the internet so often um and yeah. do things that you wouldn't do face to face is because it's really hard to look somebody in the eye and be a jerk like we're not wired for it um it's yeah. why you nice. have to brainwash people into killing each other you know that's the purpose of boot camp etc yeah. And so, yeah, I don't know. We've gotten way far adrift, but <laughs> more like beauty, great. it's yeah. all around you. No, no, <laughs> this is, this is, I think this is a discussion that, that you know, needs to be had, you yeah. know, so... Mm -hmm. And that's this, you know, this is, I mean, I, you, you said as much earlier, uh, James, that, that this is the beauty of fiction, right? Yeah. This is whatever the genre, especially perhaps fantasy and sci-fi, because, you know, we know those types of fiction they allow the reader to take a, a well to to erroneously assume they've got a step removed right from the story right, exactly exactly if you can get somebody to have a really you know strong opinion on colonization when it's exactly. you know one world you know one planet colonizing another right. at some point they might be able to transfer that <laughs> opinion over to real life colonization that's right that's right James, thank you so much for, for being <laughs> with us again. This, this was, was this is way beyond expectation. We look forward to the to the next time we can sucker you in. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, I was to, fired up tonight. <laughs> yeah, we're so glad to to continue this kind of conversation. This just this is why we love this stuff so much. It's really fun. Thank you guys. If only people knew what we talked about before we actually hit the record button. Um, then we will have no podcast. <laughs> exactly. You know, you know, one of the things, I mean, there's so many things you could take away from that conversation. And James, thank you for joining us. That was so in depth. And yeah, so, that, was, that was really lovely. It's such a deep, deep conversation. And just at a high level, one of the things that came out is, is that we are having this discussion because I believe as a society, we have moved in a direction where 
it's almost like we are incapable of having these why discussions um, yeah, yeah. around, you know, understanding. And like James talked about with his, you know, his Fox News description with the, yeah, with the yeah. woman who worked there, why people will not go and ask why someone believes what they believe. And yeah. I'll be perfectly transparent. When I was much younger, Jason knows this, I was pretty beholden to some, to, political beliefs and i wasn't really interested yep. or i thought i was but i didn't really listen um and as i've gotten older i've gotten much better at it and it is such a lost art and so i am so grateful that mm -hmm. there are people like james out there who are writing in a way that especially towards young adult that is introducing them to this idea um and it gives me hope for the younger generation because let's be honest i'll make us i'll make a political statement here Gen X, we didn't fix much it's it's up to our no. kids now it's no. up to our kids now to fix the mess we created yeah you know? I, there's some truth to that so uh G, gm corner yes so I'm, gonna I'm going to go over there oh i'm going to throw it over because you're going first okay um, i'm actually going to throw you a curveball Oh, are you? You didn't. You see, this is. I do this to you all the time. You do. And, so I'm. And, I'm. And there's a. There's a reason for it that we didn't discuss offline. I'm going to just okay. ask your indulgence of yep. staying where we go and not going where you think we were going to go. Oh, this will be interesting. Okay, okay. go for it. So, yeah. um, I, I, I hope that wasn't as opaque to you as it sounded like to us. Okay, so um, here's my curveball. Uh, as we're recording, we're a little ahead of schedule, which is nice. We're you know leading up to the winter break slash holiday season. Um, as we're recording today, uh, I got my hands on a copy of the Worlds of Android, and here's why I wanna I wanna talk about this briefly, briefly. Now um, that I knew, that I knew. Okay, but but I'm not story. going where else, and I don't I don't want us to go to the other one. I have a reason okay. for my madness. Um, Got it. Uh, and also, I think this fits better. Um, so if you're, you know, listeners, if you're not familiar with the worlds of Android, I strongly encourage you to check it out. So uh, this is a book. I, I, I'm going to call it a source book. That's a bit mislabeling. So um, Fantasy Flight Games. I'm just going to tell you the little saga because I just think this is so cool. So as you all know, I live in St. Paul and Fantasy Flight Games is up in Roseville, just almost immediately north of me i think i think it's like six miles as the crow flies or something right i can okay. just shoot up snelling and and i'm basically which in, which in twin cities traffic time is about 45 minutes no it um uh well it can be uh it's <laughs> it's it's a solid 2025 <clears throat> excuse me it's a solid 2025 okay so um fantasy flight games is nearby and um, they, in 2015, came out with the worlds of Android. Now, what inspired this was their uh, Netrunner, like card game and, 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 and tabletop mm -hmm. game that, Brad, you were already familiar with. I've, I've never played it. Familiar um, with in the, the later 90s. Thank yeah. you, yeah. And it, it, it had its heyday, had, had a real following, I think almost a cult following now. Mm -hmm. um, certainly subsequently in the past few years or well i guess uh, several years ago before ffg was absorbed by asmodee and then um you know transferred sold their licenses over to edge studio um they had come out with shadow of the beanstalk which is an android focused source book for the genesis dice mechanic which is which is really cool now uh in between there in 2015 uh, FFG released this Worlds of Android, and it's simply, simply God, it's just this book. It's not a, it's not a gaming book. It is, I can tell you, some of the most beautifully, wondrously immersive world building I have seen in any canon, in any storyline. I, I mean, I've been through it twice now, and I haven't even nicked the surface. Here's why I'm going to bring it up, and here's why I'm going to stop. In the well, I was gonna say near future, in the future, in uh, in three ish centuries from now, uh, the world as well as 
cities on on the moon, colony on Mars, out in the belt and whatnot, um, will not only be populated by we fear humans, but by androids. And it's very much a world, I'm using world in air quotes, okay? It's very much a world of the best of times and the worst of times. The 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 species us uh, is experiencing a renaissance of discovery and there are more people and there are more people than ever in poverty on the streets without jobs etc and so the entire world is really morally ambiguous and it's just it's just ridiculously rich and also the artistry uh, the artistry and the writing are just second to none. So that, my friend, is what's on my desk. And, and that's, the, be that's the end of the podcast, because you said we wanted to keep it to 10 minutes. So. <laughs> okay, sorry. That, <laughs> I'm I kidding. Just, no, no, yeah. no, no, no. This yeah. is good. So, so yes, I, you and I have talked about this book, and because of you, I picked it up as well. Mine hasn't arrived yet. Sorry, we, um, I'm sorry. We should mention, it, it. you weren't able to get this for the longest time. Yeah, this was, yeah, I mean, sorry. when you... You were literally, and I say this seriously, um, as giddy as I've seen you related to a book in a long time. 20 bucks you off know? from the Game Center, right? Which yeah. which is the old FFG store. Shout out to them. And yeah, uh, uh, I mean, it was, I don't care how long it takes to get it. Boom, take my money. And I have, and obviously um, uh, now Edge Studio, Yep. Formerly yep. FFG came out with the Genesis system, which is based off of the Star Wars narrative dice system. Yes, yes. They have a campaign book for Android. This goes beyond yeah. it. This isn't directly related to any gaming system. This is purely, and correct me if I'm wrong, almost an encyclopedic tome, if I can use two ter- yeah. two words together, yeah. regarding the, the what society the world and everything is and that time and but it's it, very un it sounds to me like it's it's in the same time period as kind of what trek used to be but it's definitely not oh, Trek. yeah that's that's a good point it's definitely not trek brad i don't know how to put it other than like when i when i, when I got it and i started sending you some photos like hey it's here right because yours is going to come in like a day or two uh it's like a mashup if you will of blade runner Mm-hmm. Trek, a bit of Star Wars. I haven't watched The Expanse, but I think it's in there too, right? And then, like, just odds and ends. It's truly creative, um, but it's super ambiguous. That reminds me, I need to put the, the Expanse on my list. I've been meaning to watch that. I, you know, I want to. I don't want to. This book, I think, deserves discussion on its own. So I don't want to take away. Yeah, we, from it. we will probably have an episode on it. Yeah, but I will say for next week's episode, actually, yes, for next week's episode. Oh, yeah. Um, we're gonna have to talk a bit more about the other book that we've gotten in the past few days. Maybe, or as this one drops, we'll have already talked about it. Okay, that's why you were shaking your head. So, <laughs> if you by 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 going back in time, you will have already Ooh. heard us talk about yeah there we go <laughs> right. like the old conan bright conan right. O'Brien we, thing. we spare no expense for yeah. our sound so, effects <laughs> so yeah so well i have remember we i bought the soundboard and the keyboard i just haven't implemented those yet. see that's uh that's a uh that's a, a, a i have my novation kind of yeah i have my novation yeah. i may i may goof around with that while you're overseas you um, are going to turn into ross when he played the keyboard at Central Park. Oh yeah, this I'm gonna make that look amateur, which it already yeah. looked like anyway. Yeah. But um, well then you then you will have already heard us talk about uh, the, the other inclination. Yes, board, the the other book which, we have been and continue to geek out over. Yeah, and I am, and beyond that, you and I have been talking about um, using the modern age. Yep. Rule yep. System. More coming. More coming. More coming on that. But that's between between Utopia Planitia and Modern Age. That's what's been on my desk yep. now. Yep. Uh, Android yep. will soon be on there. Um, and then um, one that you came up with today or yesterday um, that I will make mention of. Sorry, I think probably just moved away from the mic, so it got a little funky. Um, midnight. Oh, I. 
yes, it's such you know it's funny because James James was like you know I, it, things got so dark. Midnight is so wonderfully dark. Yeah, so we'll talk more about that one, but but that came up in the context of we got to play that in some form or another. So even though we're taking a break from D and D just because we have other things on our plate, um, it's funny how all of a sudden when we decided to take a little break a bunch of stuff came on, not including the fact that we've been dying to play Star Trek adventures forever, forever. Okay. And it we... wouldn't be, and it, as we wrap up, it wouldn't be the same if I didn't bring up Jim, because we always bring up Jim Johnson. Yeah, in an yeah. It's only a matter of time Jim. until Jim comes back to the podcast. Yeah. It's so, yeah. so cause then we got to get the smoking me, jacket. Yeah. Yeah. It re just reminds me that, that, um, we gotta, we're gonna have to have Jim back on again, and we're gonna have to talk a bit yep. about yep. Um, Utopia Planitia again and everything. So, oh yeah. So, so with that, um, you know, speaking of taking a break, uh, right now, listeners, uh, Brad and I, uh, honestly, more because of scheduling and more because of my scheduling and some family travel, uh, we are going to take a little bit of a New Year's break. So, uh, we are not going to have an episode on the 2nd of january um mm -hmm. if if we were all in our 20s then i would say something funny about how none of you are going to be in, able to listen anyways but in our 40s that's just not a problem so but but we will not be having an episode uh on the second and then we've got something um something interesting probably just the two of us lined up for episode 83 which will publish on the 9th um and uh and we'll see you then so just to hark well, back, speak for your before you go before you oh, go yeah. speak for yourself on the second um i am going to for new year's eve party to the break of 10 o'clock so i may not necessarily on new um, year's eve yes yes yeah. on new year's day i might recover from um all of the uh flavored water that i will drink the night before since i you know you're gonna paint the town beige Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and we will, we will. My my wife and girls and I will be arriving on the first back from a transatlantic flight. So the goal is on the second to be as adventurous as you are, especially yep. since we all we all go back then on the third. Um, and for me, that's just office time. But for them, first it's time, legit. first time we're not going to have an episode on a Monday in the history. Oh, I shouldn't say. No, well, no. It, well, be... remember we started monthly, and then almost yeah, immediately we say... went. I'm just checking our records right now. Um, no way. So, um, we changed that. We we went monthly, and then we went biweekly. So, uh, to revise that, this will be. This will be the first time, we haven't done a weekly podcast episode, since August of twenty one. Wow. And that's over a year. And what I'll do oh, yeah. while you're gone is um, I'm going to post some links to some past episodes. Um, awesome. Yep. Related to some of the different gaming systems and everything we had. I can think of, I can think of a couple. I'm going to surprise folks just because um, everything that we've posted, I go back to even the beginning. There's nothing that's out of date really. Other no, than no. us maybe talking with authors about books that hadn't quite come out yet. Even now better, they're out have, now. Yeah. yeah, now they're out, so you can hear yeah. the context of us talking about them. And now you can actually go get the book to do it. That's right. So. Even better. All right, everybody. As the year draws to a close, we thank you very much for sticking with us. Uh, please tell your friends. Have them subscribe. Have them listen to. Uh, harking back to just a couple weeks ago, uh, very much we wish you all a good year. We wish you all very good mental health as we move through these winter months. Uh, be well, stay well. We will see you all soon next year.